On today's episode, Tyler Reddick needed my doll Italian stormed a racetrack, plus Scott McLaughlin got cream on his face. Pause. Welcome back to the Break Hard Show. I'm Matt. It's been an eventful weekend. Labor Day weekend is always packed full of racing. You have the NASCAR Cup and Xfinity Series at Darlington, including the Southern 500, an IndyCar doubleheader in Milwaukee, Formula One with the Italian Grand Prix, and drag racing had the U.S. Nationals in Indianapolis. Their Daytona 500 and Rick Ware Racing, the racing empire that is that company, won the top fuel class at the U.S. Nationals with Clay Milliken. And at this point, I fully expect Rick Ware to be on a Formula One car, co-owner on a Formula One, entry at some point in his career where he gets all his money from i have no idea at this point he's the mattress firms of race teams i have no clue where his money's coming from who's doing business over there but they seem to have it in boatloads so if you know in the comments actually let me know but hey they might not be the best team in nascar but they were the best team in top fuel and nhra on monday so hats off to them Going into what else happened this weekend, though, it was an eventful weekend. As I said there in the intro, Tyler Reddick needed my doll, and I'm not going to do a full recap of the Southern 500. I put out a video on Monday uh, recapping that on Monday morning, so go check that out. But Reddick, uh, early on in that race, was asked by his crew, you know, what's happening to you? And he goes, I'm throwing up, I'm shitting, I'm everything just happening. <laughs> his crew chief was like, okay, so it's coming out of everywhere. About throwing up or no, just stomach stuff. Yeah, I'm throwing up, beating myself, all of it. All right, so it's both. Uh, Tyler Reddick did get out of the car after the race and said, and clarified he did not do either of those things, just felt like he was going to do that. The team gave him my doll, which if you have a girlfriend, uh, you're very aware of what my doll is and should purchase it. If you guys don't live together, keep it at your house just for safekeeping because uh, it could come in handy at some point. Pro tip of the day for you right there. You come here for racing news, you're going to get relationship advice at times. So there you go. But for for Tyler Reddick, uh, thankfully, that didn't happen in the car because as I said in the other video, that is a hazmat situation. You light that car on fire. You never talk about it again. Everybody just has this agreement. Yep, that happened. We're never talking about it again because that's disgusting. I am very much not on board with any of that. Yuck. But Reddick did not do any of that. Thankfully, he got out of the car, celebrated his regular season championship with team owner Michael Jordan and Denny Hamlin, who said that he's won a championship as a team owner, to which Kyle Larson responded, technically no, because they didn't win the owner's regular season championship, which is the one that everybody wants to win. The five car did win the owner's uh, championship regular season title because, of course, Kyle Larson did miss the Coca-Cola 600. His car did still start there with Justin Allgaier. Points were still accumulated for that five car. Thus, they win the regular season title for the owner's points. And Tyler Reddick wins the driver's regular season title by one point over Kyle Larson, who spotted the field an entire race and still only lost by one point, which is people are like, see, if he would have have skipped for Indianapolis, he wanted the would have won the regular season, would have got those 15 extra bonus points. OK, I get what you're saying there. But the bigger story is the fact that he spotted the field an entire race. He only ran 25 to 26, and he still only lost by one point, which is mightily impressive. What else came out of the Southern 500? Chase Briscoe obviously um, walked it off like Jeremy Mayfield. Some people seem to think I have a problem with Jeremy Mayfield. I have no problem with Jeremy Mayfield. I think that he probably got shafted maybe by an old NASCAR regime there. I think that there's there's obviously two sides to every story. The truth lies somewhere in the middle. I think that's a perfect example of this story. I think some things that uh, Jeremy has said are truthful. I think maybe some other things that he said is maybe stretched a little bit. Same thing from the NASCAR side. I think some things they said are truthful. Some things they've stretched a little bit. And somewhere in the middle lies the truth there. So I have no problem with Jeremy Mayfield. I, you know think that he, I, I like how open he's been. I think he was a good character when he was in the sport. And, you know, whatever side we don't have side quest with uh Jeremy mayfield from the owb michael waltrip uh, daryl waltrip the greens owb the haydens who knows what they're putting in the water down there in owensboro kentucky but something's coming out of there uh, anyway moving on back to chase briscoe he walked it off like it's 2004 at richmond you know all these tennessee fans are walking around being like it feels like 98 felt like 04 on sunday night at darlington because chase briscoe needed a win to get in he needed that's the only way he was going to make it into the nascar cup series playoffs and he got exactly what he needed he led 27 laps on sunday night wins the southern 500 his second ever nascar cup series win gets stewart haas racing back to victory lane gets that 14 car of tony stewart back to victory lane 
cool, cool moment for them in their final season as a team. Um, it's been a struggle for Stuart Haas Racing over the last few years. I mean, there's no denying that for them to be able to get a win in the season where they're going away, where you have this good group of people that have all stuck around together. And hey, listen, some people have had to jump ship and I don't blame them for that. This is a business. You have to look out for your career and your future and your well-being. Completely understand that. But for everybody that stuck around and, you know, has continued to grind over there, this is a huge win for for all of them. Huge win for Chase Briscoe, because since he announced that deal that he was moving over to Joe Gibbs Racing next year to replace Martin Truex Jr., he has been bad, like really bad to the point where, like, I would sit back and be like, <laughs> Who do we? Why do we sign this guy? One NASCAR Cup Series win can't even finish in the top twenty at this point. Like, what are we doing here? Uh, but hey, picking up a win in the Southern Five Hundred is absolutely massive for him. Of course, everybody talks about how it's reminiscent of twenty twenty when he and Kyle Busch uh, battled it out for the win in that Xfinity Series race. And now, once again, history somewhat repeating itself on Sunday night. This time in the Southern Five Hundred, Chase Briscoe versus Kyle Busch. Once again, Kyle just could not get alongside him. I still stand by the fact. I think if Kyle could have just gotten alongside of him. Um, on corner exit at any point he wins that race because i think he would have been able to pull him back to him just never could get that little bit more that he needed kyle bush finishes second for the second week in a row does not qualify for the nascar cup series playoffs he has 10 more races to try to keep his consecutive uh year win streak alive uh, i think he can do it he's got a good chance this weekend at atlanta he also has taldega coming up bristol he's always good there there's a few tracks still left that you're like kyle bush can get it done we'll have to wait and see if he can actually uh, do that. Of course, Bubba Wallace ends up not qualifying for the championship. Same with Chris Buescher, who was upset. And I get like Chris Buescher was upset, to which Kyle Petty said, oh, it's just sour grapes. You know the rules here. And Kyle Petty, people are like, this is what NASCAR needs, a, a Kyle Petty. Uh, listen, I like Kyle Petty. I think Kyle Petty has some good feedback sometimes. Sometimes I think Kyle Petty just goes the Stephen A route and just wants to be uh, combative just to be combative, which is fine because it certainly gets headlines and everything like that. But like Busher brings up a, I mean, I, why Busher's mad makes a lot of sense, right? The guy that was 34th in points and Harrison Burton is now in the playoffs. Chris Busher is not in the playoffs and he misses out because another, you know, random one-time winner gets in there. And hey, listen, Busher could have won. I get it, right? He had 26 races to win a race. He came within one one thousandth of a second of winning at Kansas, uh, obviously losing out in the closest finish in NASCAR history. That's what keeps him out of the playoffs, which is a wild thing to think about in the grand scheme of things. We're talking about a literal inch keeps him from making the playoffs or is not making the playoffs between a million dollars and not a million dollars. So for Busher, I get why he's upset. It sucks. It's the way this format is. Uh, but it's like the whole don't hate the player, hate the game thing. The game is inherently flawed, but it's the rules that are laid out. So we're just going to have to play by them. Still would love to see a three race championship round, not a one race championship round, but uh, I'm not sure we're ever going to get that. So Briscoe ends up winning the race. Kyle Larson dominated the night, led 263 of 367 laps, ends up coming home fourth. His car just faded there at the end, got swallowed up on uh, some restarts and just couldn't get back around. Bush was on fresher tires uh, there. So yeah, I think for Larson, probably a bummer because even if he finishes third, he ends up tied with Tyler Reddick uh, for that championship, regular season championship, ends up winning it. So yeah, you can you know, toss the things around, but it, you know, it is what it is at this point. Overall, I really like that Darlington race. I gave it a 93 or a 92, somewhere in that range. I know some people maybe weren't as psyched about it, especially in the middle portion of the race, kind of got dull for, for some people. Um, I watched parts of it on my phone when I was at a fundraiser on Sunday night and then rewatched it Sunday night into Monday morning uh, when I got home. I really enjoyed it. I thought the broadcast was great top to bottom. Some people talked about how they thought Lee Diffie maybe had struggled this week. Um, I don't necessarily think Lee Diffie struggled. I think Lee Diffie's just falling into um, kind of the groove of things. I still think he's an incredible get for the NBC booth. And NBC, top to bottom, did a really good job explaining, doing double box, triple box at times. Fox would never. Um, so yeah, I'm happy with with what we got from NBC. Happy with the race overall. Congrats to Chase Briscoe. Obviously, if you guys follow uh, my account on TikTok here, Twitter, something like that, you know that I'm generally a, a Chase Briscoe hater because I think the guy just continually puts himself in bad spots over drives and wrecks people and gets out and is like, I don't like to race that way. And I fully expected him to do that on Sunday night. Just absolutely junk it, especially going three wide right there. Expected to take himself, Kyle Larson, Ty Gibbs, maybe in Ross Chastain out. And he didn't. He survived. And maybe that's the turning of a new leaf for Chase Briscoe. We'll have to wait and see. Moving backwards to the Saturday Xfinity Series race, uh, Sheldon Creed. 
So it looks like he's on his way to his first ever NASCAR Xfinity Series victory. He's cruising. He's just out there driving along, just waiting for that checker flag to come. And then AJ Allmendinger absolutely stuffs it into the corner there. Just a brutal hit for him. Glad he's all right. Uh, NASCAR holds the caution for a long time, finally throws it and sets up a late race restart into overtime. The field comes down and gets tires. Creed gets beat off pit road. He go, comes in first, leaves third. Could not get back around. It looked like he might have had a shot there if uh, the the 20 and the double zero wreck on that last lap ends up not happening. Christopher Bell wins the race. Woo. Christopher Bell is immensely talented. Has so much talent. Boring. He's just a boring guy, which is fine, right? Like, hey, go out there and do your job. Win races. There's just... It's just boring. And that's... I'm sorry if that's a slight at <laughs> Chris, Christopher Bell, but dang. Uh, for Sheldon Creed, though, he ends up finishing third, gets out of the car after the race, and he's just like broken, it's essentially what he is. And, he, and then he says the line where he said, you know, we got all the money together that we could this year to do this deal. I'm not making a single dollar this year. And that's really surprised the Internet, to which I talked about sort of how these deals are, are laid out. And um, so. We'll just run through it real quickly here for Sheldon Creed. So he has a budget, right? He has a sponsor. He has a budget. He's taking that to Joe Gibbs Racing. And we'll just say that it's four to $5 million a year, whatever. Um, so he has that money for, for the budget. How a lot of the times this works is when drivers secure a budget like this from a sponsor, from a family, something like that, they have the option to take a percentage of that for themselves. So say they're like, I want to make $100,000 this year. So if you have $4 million that you have in your budget, you take out $100,000 and then $3.9 million is going over to the team so that he has a salary to live on. The team has that money for the car. What it sounds like in this situation is Sheldon didn't take any money for himself, for a salary. All that money's going into the car. All that money's going into this program to try to make it a 100 out of 100, A plus program at the best program that it can possibly be for this season. He, of course, is moving over to Haas Factory in 2025. But for now, he has this deal in place and he's not taking any salary this year, which is huge, right? I mean, that's a big thing. Obviously, he has some financial means that he can fall back on, which is great for him. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a weird situation. Surprised a lot of people. It's very similar to like when Daniel Hemrick said that he was only getting paid for top fives when he was at Joe Gibbs Racing. Sometimes that's just how these drivers structure these, structure these deals to take, uh, you know, they're betting on themselves here to win and then hopefully hoping that that will pay off in the future. And that's what Creed is it sounds like he's doing uh, in this situation. Obviously, other deals are different. Some people bring budget. They also get a percentage of the winnings or they have incentives for top fives, wins, stuff like that. Um, but it sounds like this situation is very similar to some other deals that we've heard about in the past. So Chris Bell ends up winning the race. Uh, Cole Custer comes home second and Sheldon Creed third. Overall, pretty pretty good Xfinity Series race. Xfinity always delivers. X Xfinity at Darlington is great. Cup at Darlington is great. Darlington is top two, one of the best tracks uh, on the NASCAR schedule. Top three, probably. It's Darlington, Homestead, Kansas. Somewhere in those three is is where this one lies. So, overall, great great weekend at Darlington. There's also a new NASCAR weekly show coming to True TV this Thursday, September 5th, which will be a roundtable discussion inside NASCAR. Think about inside the NBA that they have for NBA games on TNT, that version just for NASCAR. We'll have Jordan Bianchi, Shannon Spake, um, Steve Letarte, Mamba Smith, and a rotating driver. It seems like it's going to be Kyle Busch for the first two weeks. Apparently, my invitation for the show got lost in the mail. Uh, I think Jordan Bianchi is a great addition. He has obviously tons of tons of information, tons of insider information. Shannon Spake's been around the sport forever. She's quality. Steve Letarte, he's a good media personality, knows the ins and outs of the engineering side of things. Mama Smith is not my cup of tea. He's apparently other people's cup of tea, which is great. Uh, I could do without him. If he's on the show, fine. But I don't consume Harvick's podcast, so I couldn't tell you uh, if he's good or bad, just has never really appealed to me. And then having a rotating driver, Kyle Busch is a great addition for the first two episodes. I'm interested to see who they get for other episodes, because I think there's some good quality drivers out there that have good personalities that could really show it out on this. But hey, True TV, TNT Sports. If you would like somebody else to join the dais and join the discussion panel, you can find me at <laughs> breakhardblog at gmail.com.
Moving on to IndyCar to recap their doubleheader real quick. Hand up. I did not expect IndyCar Milwaukee to be good. I put out a video where I was like, IndyCar Milwaukee, modern IndyCar at Milwaukee stinks. They shouldn't go there. The racing's never that good. There's only going to be like 15,000 people in the stands. Hey, credit to everybody in Milwaukee that showed up. Stands look pretty good. Next year, obviously consolidating two races into one should really help how the attendance looks. The racing was good top to bottom as well. And on Saturday in the first race, which was exclusively on Peacock, and I said, hey, that's probably a good thing since nobody's going to show up. That was actually one of the better races that we've seen, and it's unfortunate that was only on Peacock. Uh, we saw... Um, Pato Award pick up his third victory of the season, second victory where he's driven underneath the checkered flag, but he wins on an oval, which is great for him. Obviously, he has won in Iowa as well, Texas too. So Pato Award has done a great job um, rebounding, especially in a weekend that was pretty tumultuous considering he said that, you know, IndyCar should already have been in Mexico even before NASCAR announced their date, to which IndyCar CEO Mark Miles responded and was like, Paddle Award's not even as popular as Adrian Fernandez, the last big Mexican driver, but hey, at least he's on some billboards now. To which Paddle responded and was like, speaking of billboards, and posted a photo of the billboard in Milwaukee advertising the NASCAR race and not the IndyCar race. And yeah, they had a nice little back and forth. And apparently, according to Jenna Fryer now, IndyCar and Mexico City are talking about having a date there, and that's often sprinting. We'll see if it actually happens. Not going to happen for 2025, but I'm sure Mark Miles will come out and say that we're working forward towards having an international race, the same thing that he's been talking about since like 2014, and it still hasn't happened yet. So I just stopped believing anything that Mark Miles and the leadership over at IndyCar say until it actually happens. I heard Jay for I say this week that they're working on a lighter chassis. Great. Well, when you show it to me, then I'll believe it because the current chassis is 12 years going on 13 years old next year. But in race number one, you have Paddle Award win. You had Will Power come home in second as he continued to try to fight for the championship. And you have Connor Daly driving from 25th all the way up to third, getting a podium finish for Hunko's Hollinger Racing, their first ever in the IndyCar series. Connor's second, I believe, in IndyCar. A huge result for that team. Uh, yeah, I mean, Roman Grosjean still hasn't got them a podium, and he's a Formula One driver. There's no such thing as a mid Formula One driver. That's what the internet told me, except he mid. He's really mid. That's why he's not Formula One. But it was a solid race on uh, Saturday. You had Marcus Erickson and Joseph Newgarden crash together. Uh, that was more of a racing incident in my mind than anything else. Uh, you had Daly making moves, like, as he said, uh, Tomas Schechter on the outside there, just using as any lane that was possible. If there's pavement there, we're going to try to use it. And it worked out really well for him. Overall, that first race was pretty solid. Come back on Sunday, and you're having the start of the race. The start of the race on Saturday was abandoned. They racked him, went again. We're about to start the race on Sunday. Cars go out for the pace laps. Alex Plo is stopped on the apron. Cars just dead, dead in the water, cease to exist, as uh, they say in uh, Pineapple Express. And he's just sitting there. And then you're trying to restart the car, restart the computer, this and that. The race ends up starting under caution because I've just been out there running so many pace laps. I finally get him off track, get him back to the garage. It turns out it was a 12 volt battery. Uh, the race starts, five laps completed already. And as they're about to go take the green flag, they wave off the start once again because the field isn't bunched up enough. And Marcus Armstrong just didn't Marcus Armstrong and Linus Lundquist just did not get the message there. Uh, they make contact, which then runs into the back of the two car Joseph Newgarden. He crashes his days done before it actually really even started. He did complete five laps and Mark or Joseph over the radio said, I guess somebody didn't get the memo. So then Joseph goes to the infield care center, gets out. He's talking to uh, NBC Sports uh, after you know, getting knocked out. And the reporter, she goes, and I apologize for not having her name off the top of my head here. I have an idea, but I'm going to butcher the last name. So I'm just not saying it. Um, she asked him, you know, over the radio said somebody didn't get the memo. And Joseph just goes, don't ask me that question. It's a very fair question to ask. Like, who were you referring to there? And so many hardos on the internet were like, she should, she should ask a better question. She asked a dumb question, get a dumb answer. All these people that were like sticking up for Joseph Newgarden. And then maybe there's just a lot of Newgarden fans out there. I'm not sure why you would be a Newgarden fan. Guy's kind of just rude at this point. He's just not a good, not a good guy. Um, but he doesn't know if he wants to be a bad guy or a good guy. Really seems to be somewhere lost in purgatory. But she asked a valid question, like, who were you referring to? And Joseph could have just been like, ah, oh, you know, it was heat of the moment. I was frustrated. Uh, you know, just a bummer type of thing. And then said he yells at a reporter. Now we're going to have to have all of our questions pre-screened by IndyCar before they ask Joseph Newgarden anything. I don't know. Just left a bad taste in my mouth. Race number two goes on. Will Power has a really good shot of, you know, taking the championship lead. In all honesty, like, he was running in position to take the championship lead heading into the final race at Nashville because Polo was 30 plus laps down. Power ends up spinning out spins out, ruins his chances of 
of taking that points lead. Now he goes into Nashville having to finish in the top three. And that's going to be difficult. Not impossible, but it all depends on where Polo finishes at as well. Uh, Scott McLaughlin goes on to win the race. His second oval win uh, of the season of his career. Gets smashed in the face by a cream puff, which Will Power is looking at the day before and was very concerned about what it was. <laughs> McLaughlin's just got cream all over his face. It's pause and it was just i don't know why we're smashing cream puffs but they were out there doing it overall i thought the weekend at milwaukee was pretty solid uh no complaints out of me i'm excited for them to go back next year it was a positive step and hopefully you know the fans come out they said they're committed to a three-year deal there through 2026 uh that's a good thing if they continue to race as well as they did on saturday and sunday Moving on to the Formula One race, the Italian Grand Prix. Ferrari outsmarted everybody. Hell has frozen over. Pigs are about to fly once again. But Ferrari did outsmart everybody on strategy. What we thought was going to be a McLaren victory with Oscar Piastri, Lando Norris, turns out to be a Charles Leclerc victory for Ferrari, and they went absolutely wild. A picture of Charles standing up on the podium, taking a selfie with the sea of people behind him was incredible. Hats off to them. Did not think we'd ever see the day that the Ferrari pit wall would be smarter than anyone else in the pit lane. And honestly, this falls on McLaren for just being dum-dums. Just really stupid strategy all day. Uh, obviously, Lando Norris, Oscar Piastri on the front row on the first lap going into the second chicane. Piastri passes Norris in the chicane. And Lando Norris is... Hey, you know how people talk about the chair that sits and looks at the bed in uh, in hotel rooms? That might be Lando Norris at this point. That guy has to assert his dominance at some point because it's just not working out for him at all. He's getting pushed around by his teammate and Oscar Piastri. Apparently, McLaren keeps referring to them as two number one drivers, which is an interesting wording. I wonder if I think others have speculated about this, too, that Oscar Piastri could potentially have it in his contract where he has to be a number one driver. And Lando's kind of just getting stuck here. And it looked like we were about to see a Piastri victory. He'd have two victories on the season. So with Lando and Lando's been trying so long to get one victory. Now he and Piastri would have two in the same year. It would be a bad look for Lando, but McLaren continues to just drop the ball here. McLaren should be better than they are. They should have more race wins. They should have more points than constructors. And instead, they seemingly don't know what to do. They need to prioritize one driver. It just, they just have to. Uh, as much as people are like, oh, just let them go out and race. Right now, they're not contending for a world championship, not between the two of them. They need to prioritize a driver to contend for the world championship, that being Lando, because he's higher up in the points right now. And then they need to maximize the amount of points that the team can get. They're not doing that. And they are catching Red Bull in the Constructors title. Red Bull, best driver in the world, Max Verstappen, could only salvage a sixth-place finish. Turns out he does need a really good car to be really good. Although the internet tells me he's the best driver in the world, they don't want to talk about how he needs the best car in the world, too. So it's an interesting uh, bit that nobody seems to want to talk about when we bring up best driver in the world topic but for ferrari they end up winning the race huge for them huge for charles i don't think it fixes anything else that they've had problem wise this year still don't expect them to be contenders in baku don't expect them to be contenders in singapore um maybe in in las vegas they you know monza's a weird circuit and they were good on sunday so hats off to them for making that strategy work McLaren, what are you doing? You got to figure it out. Uh, you tried to one stop from lap, what, 14 for Piastri, and it just was never going to work out uh, from there. So overall, pretty entertaining Italian Grand Prix. Real quick race. The Italian Grand Prix flies by. It's like 53 laps or 57 laps, somewhere in there. It usually falls between like an hour 10, an hour 20 minutes. Uh, just bang, bang, get it up and down, and we're out of there real quick out of the out of Italy. All right, moving on to a bit of silly season news real quick. This past weekend on Saturday at Darlington, College Racing announced Christian Eck is as their driver for the 16 Xfinity car in 2025. If you've been following this channel, Twitter, anything like that, you know that that was going to happen. They formalized it. So now their lineup is Josh Williams, Daniel Dye, and Christian Eck is. I expect Nick Sanchez to go to Xfinity next year. How that deal all works, still trying to figure that one out, but I expect him to be there. Corey Heim will return to the truck series as much as people continue to ask. Updates on Ryan Priest. People always want updates on Ryan Priest. Don't have one. Obviously, Adam Stern mentioned his name for a third RFK car, which got the um, Priest of Maniacs or whatever you want to refer to yourself as all hyped up. Still haven't heard anything else about that there. Harrison Burton, expect him to be in the Xfinity series, maybe with an AM Racing or another team. He does have budget to bring with him. What about the number seven car at Spire? So Justin Haley's name is who we keep hearing. 
And that's the name that seems to be the most obvious out there, but it is taking a long time to announce this deal. And maybe there's something else afoot here happening around. There's some wild, wild rumors that are flying around. I'm not going to touch on them because they haven't been. I, I hear different rumors from different people involving some of the same people, but never really the same setup. So not going to mention that because as I've told you guys before, I won't mention any silly season stuff on here unless I've confirmed it with two people and two people that I completely trust. So haven't done that, but something's taken a while and maybe it's still just just inhaling that won't announce it yet but something seems a little off in that situation uh still expect zane smith to go to front row motorsports i know kevin harvick said that ford's maybe blocking him that may just be uh kevin harvick saying that i'm not sure but it doesn't necessarily seem based off other people i've talked to that that's a hundred percent uh what's happening over there but still expect him to land over there for 2025 Corey LaJoy heard he was going to the truck series, heard that he might have an opportunity at Rick Ware. Um, we'll see what happens there with Corey. I think that the truck opportunity that he has, I'm uh, not sure if he's signed his deal, but I know the truck that he has an opportunity to drive down at uh, McAnally, uh, which would be Christian Eck's truck, would be a great get for, for him. Um, that's the truck that it continues to be rumored about for, for Corey. We'll see if that happens, but that's kind of where silly season stands for right now. Joe Gibbs Racing have his multiple openings in the Xfinity Series, as we know, but I think those seats are already probably taken. Junior Motorsports has another seat open uh, at Gibbs. Fully expect uh, Taylor Gray, William Sawalich, maybe Brandon Jones to be back over there in 2025. And then uh, at JRM, interested to see who takes over that fifth, fourth seat. So obviously right now we know they have under contract Sammy Smith, Justin Allgaier, Connor Zilich. Does Brandon Jones return to the team or do they get somebody else? Eh, we'll have to wait and see. Yo. All right, looking ahead to next weekend or this upcoming weekend, we only have the NASCAR Xfinity and Cup Series in action. Xfinity on Saturday at Atlanta, Cup Series on Sunday at Atlanta, 3 p.m. on NBC. It is going to be a very interesting race, especially having a drafting track start off the playoffs. Somebody could lock themselves into the next round immediately, or we could get another random winner that has no effect on the championship whatsoever. People could lose ground this weekend. It will be very interesting to see what happens. So let me know in the comments what you think about all the racing that happened this past weekend. The show, like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard